My topic today is good angels and bad angels. But before I talk to you about this important subject, I want to introduce my wife, Beverly. She was only five feet tall, but what she lacked in height, she made up in courage and spirit. Even the American government found that out. Clara Barton was born in Massachusetts on Christmas Day in 1821 and is best remembered as founder of the American Red Cross. Clara lived at a time when young women didn't have too many job choices but she wasn't the kind of person to sit around until everything was right. When a need appeared, she saw it as an opportunity to serve God and her fellow man. Clara was a true pioneer. She began teaching school when the majority of teachers were only men, or were men, I shouldn't say only, should I, but were men at the age of 18, and she soon became an excellent teacher. But then in her early 30s, she decided to change jobs and went to work in Washington, D.C. in the patent office. On March 4, 1861, she in attended the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. A few weeks later, the Civil War began. And as one reads Clara's life story, one can see how Providence had led her to the Capitol for such a time as this. From the start of the Civil War, Clara saw a great need for both practical and nursing assistance for the wounded and dying as they were brought back to Washington, D.C. She and a group of ladies collected food and medical supplies. They cleansed and dressed wounds and did what they could to make the soldiers comfortable until the doctors could see them. After a while, it dawned on Clara that if medical help could be given right on the front lines, they could save many more lives. And so she pleaded with the government, and they finally gave in, and permission was given to go to the front lines, and she took wagons of supplies, and she and her helpers helped, and they wept as they saw thousands of soldiers bleeding and groaning. Many had lost limbs. Many had bullets lodged in their bodies. But Clara and her team, they worked day and night with the doctors to save as many as possible. This was her work for the remainder of the Civil War. In 1869, she went to Europe to have some much needed rest. And while there, her friends introduced her to the Red Cross movement which called for all countries to agree that medical workers, ambulances, and field hospitals should be treated as neutral so that they could treat the wounded on either side. This agreement was named the Geneva Convention. As the Red Cross was founded in Switzerland, the first conference decided that they would adopt the emblem, the Swiss flag, but in reverse colors. Now, the flag for Switzerland is a white cross on a red background, but the red cross, as you can see here, is a red cross on white background. And I think that's rather appropriate for a movement that was founded on compassion for the wounded. On her return to the US, she fought hard and successfully for the setting up of the American Red Cross and the signing of the Geneva Convention. She worked in the Franco-Prussian War, the Turkish-Armenian War, and she was 74 at the time of that one. And then a year later, she went to Cuba to help in the Spanish-American War. As if that work wasn't enough, she added the job of helping in disasters like floods, hurricanes, fires, and earthquakes. This relief work plan was added to the International Red Cross and became known as the American Amendment. She remained the president of the American Red Cross until 1904, when at the age of 83, she thought it was time to retire. And for the next few years, she enjoyed her nieces and nephews and their families. 
She passed away at the age of 91. She was once, uh, once asked, how did you put up or how did you cope with all the carnage and horrors of wars and disasters? Her answer was, God helps me. And she often quoted the text, Even, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. In times of war and disaster, the Red Cross brings hope to the wounded. At Calvary, when Jesus spilt his blood, the whole world was brought not only hope, but the promise of eternal life. Welcome today to the Carter Report. Our topic is good angels and bad angels. Would you please take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Daniel. And this is the 10th in the series on the greatest of the prophets, the book of Daniel. The 10th in the series, chapter 10. Good angels and bad angels. Daniel chapter 10 and uh, Verse 1, and I want to welcome every person today who is watching the telecast and those who are meeting here in church with me today. Daniel 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Notice what he's called, king of Persia. A revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Let me give you the historical context. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And the Jews, because of their unfaithfulness to the covenant, had gone into captivity for how long? 70 years. Now the 70 years have come to a close. And a few people have gone back to help to rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. But things are not looking good. In fact, things are looking very, very bad. Keep your finger there and come with me to the book of Ezra, chapter 4, and verses 1 to 6. Ezra, chapter 4. Verses 1 to 6, one of the little historical books that talks about the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 and onwards. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Ezahaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so the work went ahead during times of great difficulty. And the enemies of God sent this letter, verse 11. This is a copy of the letter they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of Trans-Euphrates, the king should know that the Jews who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute or duty will be paid and the royal revenues will suffer. If you want to get the ear of a government bureaucrat, tell him that the taxes are going to be cut. And so the Jews 
not many of them because most of them had settled down in idle ease in Babylon. But the little remnant that had gone to Jerusalem were facing awful difficulty, difficulties, big problems. Let me tell everybody who is watching the telecast this truth. Whenever a great work is attempted by the servants of God, there is always great opposition. And sometimes you can tell that God is for it if certain religious leaders are against it. And these people were opposing in the name of God. We too worship your God. Pious humbugs they were. Whenever a great work is done for God, there is great opposition. Don't forget it. The Apostle Paul said, God has set before me an open door and there are many adversaries. It is always, always true. An open door always breeds great adversaries. The great Matthew Henry, perhaps the greatest of the commentators, the great English gentleman said in his commentary, Good men cannot but mourn to see how slowly the work of God goes on in the world and what opposition it meets with, how weak its friends and how active its enemies. This has always been true. How weak its friends even in high religious places, how weak its friends and how strong the enemies. And so this chapter of Daniel chapter 10 is in the context of religious opposition to the building of the temple. Would you please notice the next verse, please? No, notice that same verse again. In the third year, Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. Just go back to that passage. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true. What does it say? And it concerned, say it with me, it concerned a great war. A great war. This great war it's been called the Great Controversy. Did you know that every one of us is a part of this great war that is called the Great Controversy? It is a war between invisible forces. This great war involves the entire universe. What is at stake? Who will rule the universe? It is a battle between light and darkness, truth and error, good and evil, and good and evil angels. It is the war between Messiah, God's prince, and another prince, who is called Satan. Today, we're going to talk about the war between good angels and evil angels as it affects every one of us sitting here in church, as it affects every person watching the telecast. In the book of Daniel, we studied a week or two back, there was the nefarious little horn. You remember? And he reaches into heaven and he casts down some of the starry host to the ground and he makes war against the temple of God, the people of God, the gospel of God and the law of God. This little horn is his infernal majesty, the devil. And this war has gone on for a long, long time before this earth was made. So it goes back a long, long time. 
If you come, keep your finger there and come to Revelation 12. We have a plain statement concerning the battle for the universe, the battle for you and for me. Revelation 12, verse 7 and onwards. Amazing, almost incomprehensible words. Revelation 12, 7 and onwards. And there was war in heaven. Michael, stop for a moment. Michael, the very word means he who is God. He who is like God. This is one of the names for the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Notice, my dear friends, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Let me have your eyes. Virtually every cynic believes in goodness. That it is theologically, scientifically, philosophically, psychologically impossible to have good without God. And while many, many people will acknowledge the fact that there is a God, there are less who acknowledge the fact that evil which is live spelled backward, evil like good is born in a personality. And the Bible teaches that there is a real God and he has holy angels with the capacity to fight for the truth. And that there is a great master mind of deception, a spirit being who presides over a kingdom of evil angels. And these evil angels or spirits have great powers of deception. Their powers of deception are so great that they are even deceiving television evangelists here in the United States of America. While I shall not mention his name, most of you will be able to guess it. He is probably the richest television, and most of them are very rich. He is probably the richest television evangelist the best known television evangelist with the greatest outreach from America to the world. And on a great television network, which is religion, he says in the program, this is your day, June 11, 1997. Well, anyway, in this one, in this vision that I saw, I saw Miss Kuhlman, Catherine Kuhlman. Of course, she's dead. And he said, and she said, follow me. That's all she said. And I followed her to a second room. In that second room stood the Lord. When the Lord, when I saw the Lord, Catherine disappeared. She had just gone. He snaps his fingers. Now the Lord looked at me and said, follow me. And I followed him to a third room. In the third room sat, sat a gentleman. I still remember his face. I can tell you, I can still remember the man's face. And the man sat in this wheelchair in that third, third room. There was a big hole in his neck, a, true, a tube down his throat. He was crippled on his wheelchair. And he had tubes down his body, totally crippled, totally paralyzed. The Lord laid his hands on this man and he, 
As he did, the tubes disappeared, the hole closed. He was completely healed and got up off the wheelchair. It was a creative miracle. Now I'm standing watching the Lord in this vision heal this man. And now as the man was healed, the Lord looked at me with piercing eyes. I'll not forget that one, I'll tell you. Looked at me with piercing eyes and said, do it and the evangelist snaps his fingers and the dream and the vision came to an end. When I awoke, when I got up, when I came out of the vision, I was trembling and perspiring from head to toe. I know exactly what this vision means. It was Catherine Kuhlman who took me and introduced me to the Holy Spirit. This evangelist goes to the grave of Kuhlman, this great faith healer, And there at the grave, he receives the mighty anointing and shakes all over. You know what we call this? It's a spiritism. And as he is talking, he says, the anointing is coming upon me powerfully. It's even making my hair stand up and... uh, The man interviewing him is saying, Jesus, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. In fact, they have said on this telecast that the dead are going to be raised to life by touching the television screen. Don't laugh about it. It's going to happen. But it won't be the dead, but evil spirits impersonating the dead, and the Christian world is going to go crazy. People love this stuff. They love this stuff. They love the sensation. But a spiritism, evil spirits. The same man has received a vision. Uh, Has he? Uh, I think he has. And he says, the Lord Jesus is going to appear on my platform when I'm doing the healings. One day I'm going to speak about the healings. You need to know it. You need to know the truth and not be brainwashed. And he said to the man who owns the great network, you know, In one of my meetings, you were there. We got it on television. Jesus walked down the aisle. We got Jesus. He's going to appear on the stage. And we're going to see people raised from the dead. It is spiritism. It is demonism. In the church. In America. And millions are shouting, hallelujah, praise the Lord. This chapter, chapter 10, is a battle for the souls of men and women between good angels and bad angels. The Bible says there was a great war. I ask you, my friend, what sort of soldier are you? What sort of soldier are you in the war? for the preaching of the gospel? Are you the sort of soldier who comes to church for an hour or two every week and you think you've done God a favor? What sort of soldier are you? What would the church be like if everybody was like you? This chapter is the great controversy, the war for the souls of men and women. Verse two, at that time I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks because the work was not going ahead. He was not having a fun day, apparently. He mourned for three weeks, ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month as I was standing on the banks of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite. 
his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Here, the prophet is subject to fatigue, perhaps even a little depression. He has prayed that the captivity of his people might come to an end, but most of them, when it comes to an end, say, hey, we're happy here in Babylon. And the little group that goes back to Babylon, most of them build themselves beautiful houses. They don't care about the temple. And those who are building the temple are faced with tremendous opposition. And when things look the worst, he sees a man standing above it all, dressed in glory. His face is like the lightning. His body translucent, filled with glory. He sees the eyes like flaming torches. This is more than a man. This is Christ the Lord. This is Messiah. And what has Christ the Lord come to Daniel at this time of great emergency and apparent discouragement to tell him, Daniel, you cannot judge how things are going with just the normal eye. Because behind the scenes, God stands in the shadows and God is in charge. You and I should never, never, never give up or think that we are defeated or the church is defeated because there is the man who stands above it all, the conquering Christ. You read about him, my friend, uh, over here in Revelation chapter 1. John saw the same person when they tossed John over onto the Isle of Patmos and they said, we're closing that chapter. At his lowest moment, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Revelation 1, 13 to 18. Revelation 1, 13 to 18. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. This is the same person. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of of rushing waters, or many voices. In his right hand he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Listen. He's almost overwhelmed with the cares of life and being in this great battle. And there comes the same person. Messiah, who is dead and is alive again, he is the same person who appears to the prophet in Daniel chapter 10. You see, to all appearances, as far as Daniel was concerned, he's now an old man. You know how old he is? 
He's 90. He's 90, still going strong. Ministers don't retire. Ministers who retire and go into real estate were never ministers in the first place. HMS Richards said, there are two things that a minister can't do. He can't lie and he can't retire. Even if the conference stops paying you, you don't retire. You have a little more freedom. <laughs> now listen, here is Daniel, almost overcome by sorrow. It appears to the human eye that Yahweh Elohim has surrendered the helm to another power. That's how it appears. It appears as though the ship of God's state has been hijacked and God is on the run. It appears as though the kingdom of God is facing ignominious defeat. And then Christ appears. And he comes and he says, I am still here. And God's people will triumph. And he says, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I want to say to you, listen carefully, when you are at your lowest, when your friends have betrayed you, when church leaders seem more like girly men than God's men, when the cause of evangelism is thrown into the gutter, when the church has millions and millions for bureaucracies, but none for the cross of Christ, fear not, God is still there. He is still in charge. And he will not be defeated. So Daniel sees the Lord high and lifted up in all his glory. But this is only the start. Look, Daniel 10, 7 and onwards. Daniel 10, 7 and onwards. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep. My face to the ground. That is the Messiah. But now, verse 10, I'm going to show you another person comes. Verse 10, you ready? Another person comes. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you. And stand up, for I've now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Now, my friend, before we go any further, I want you to notice what happens when a man meets God. When a man meets God, he is not proud and full of himself. You meet some people who are religious and they're as proud as peacocks. Oh, I have never sinned. That's the attitude. Think what a great person I am. It has been said by a great theologian in the presence of God. All self is cast to the ground. Extreme self-love and pride are the effects of ignorance of God. And so people who are haughty and filled with themselves and think they're better than you or I, 
are not the servants of God. Here is the prince of prophets. He meets God. He falls to the ground. He said, I've got no strength left. But then God sends an angel. This being who sets him on his feet and says to him, be strong, is not our Lord. Our Lord sends this other person. This other person we will see is Gabriel. Gabriel, would you please notice as we read on in this fascinating, wonderful, marvelous chapter. Please notice as we read on. I want you to see this, please. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 12. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince, now notice this, doesn't say the king, doesn't say Cyrus, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, that's the Messiah, one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Listen very carefully. Here is another being who was sent by God to help the prophet. This is not the Messiah. He's seen the Messiah. And the Messiah says to another mighty being, but less than the Messiah, Go and explain the vision to the prophet. This is the same being who appeared to Daniel in earlier visions. Would you please take your Bible and notice Daniel 9 and verse 21 and 22 because this is a continuation of the prophecy of the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. Daniel chapter 9 verse 21 while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I'd seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. And if you come to chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 15, while I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me one stood who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, Tell this man the meaning of the vision. Who is Gabriel? Who is Gabriel? We're well, not the Messiah. The Messiah is Michael, the prince. But who is Gabriel? Ah, Gabriel is the mighty angel who took the place of Lucifer. Once upon a time, Lucifer stood in the very presence of God as the covering cherub. But he was cast out of the presence of God. And another angel came and was elevated to the place that Lucifer had filled. And his name is Gabriel. Now, listen to this, because I'm sure most of you have never heard this before explained. He says this, Daniel, I've had a difficult time with the prince of Persia. I had to stay with the king of Persia, that's Cyrus. But he said, I was fighting the prince of Persia for 21 days and I was losing the battle until Michael came and turned the battle. Who is the prince of Persia? It's not Cyrus. He's the king of Persia. Listen to this amazing revelation. Satan has a kingdom. He has a hierarchy of spirit beings. 
And there in the court of Cyrus the Great was an unseen prince from the kingdom of darkness. Perhaps even Satan himself. Or one of his assistants. And he had been sent to stop Cyrus from letting the people of God go back to Jerusalem. He was there to frustrate the building of the kingdom of God. He is called the Prince of Persia. You say, this is more than I can believe. My friend, uh, this is plainly taught all through the Bible. I want you to come with me, keep your finger there and come to Isaiah verses, uh, chapter 14, verse 12 and onwards. Isaiah chapter 14, dear friends, and uh, verse 12 and uh, onwards. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 and onwards. Have you got it? How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, O Lucifer, son of the morning, it says in the King James Version. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my stars, my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, I ask you the question, who is this? Answer me. Are you sure it is Satan? Well, look back a little further at this verse, if you don't mind. Isaiah 14 and verse 4. You will take up this taunt against who? Well, come on, tell me, what does it say? You will take up your taunt against whom? The king of Babylon. Therefore, the words I read to you apply primarily to the king of Babylon. The real king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. But there was a real king of Babylon. Who was it? It was Satan. Satan has his ambassadors to every nation in the world. In every parliament, in every government, there is a battle that concerns the kingdom of God. And Cyrus was trying to let the people of God go. But the prince of Persia came and Gabriel met him face to face. But not even God or an angel can change a man's heart if he doesn't want to. The almighty God has placed restrictions upon himself. This is called freedom of choice. But by the power of his massive mind, uh, using all his skill, he worked upon the heart of Cyrus. It was 21 days. And Satan was doing the same. And there was a stalemate. And then Gabriel cried out, he said, Michael, come to my help. And Michael came. Do we have any idea of the battle that goes on for the souls of men and women? Do we have any idea, I ask you? Here the veil is drawn back. And the Bible tells us, shows us, the real power behind earthly kingdoms. Satan has his own kingdom with his own hierarchy and he appoints secret, invisible ambassadors of darkness to the nations of the world. Demons who are charged with the task of destroying God's people. 
Prince of Persia. There's the Prince of Washington. There's the Prince of Moscow. There's even the Prince of Canberra, I guess. The Prince of Berlin. The Prince of London. And these demonic forces work with all their might to turn legislation against the kingdom of God. There is a great battle that goes on in every capital of the world to hurt the kingdom of God and destroy the church. And in every home, there's an ambassador sent to your home. Demons charged with the task of destroying the kingdom of God in your home. Look at verse 13. But the prince, not the king, that was Cyrus. This is the prince. This is a demon. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. Listen to me. It says here, your people. Now today, I don't have a lot of time to explain this to you. But this prophecy, Daniel 8, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, and Daniel 12, concern what's going to happen to God's people in the last days. We ask the question, who are God's people? Israel of the Spirit. The Bible says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither barbarian or Greek, neither slave nor free, neither man nor woman, but you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. God's people today is an invisible kingdom. Our dear brother Blake and brother Bert in this church have a Jewish background. They are God's children, not because they are Jewish, but because they have accepted the Messiah. We have in this church many Americans. You are God's children, not because you're Americans. Because America, like all the nations, is a Gentile nation. But Americans who are God's children are God's children because they belong to Christ. God has got children in Russia, among the Arabs, among the Jews, among the Indians, among the Australians, among the British, among the Germans. All of these flags here represent God's children. So this prophecy is given to tell us what's going to happen to God's children. That's an important question. What's going to happen to God's children? Please read on with me. Daniel chapter 10, 15 and onwards. I just love this book of Daniel. Verse 15. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face towards the ground and was speechless. The one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and I began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I'm overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Look at me, let me tell you something. Do you want to know when a person is the strongest? When he's at his weakness. 
we get proud like peacocks, all puffed up with our self-importance. When we think that we're really good and we're doing well, watch out, the devil's got us. But when a man says, I'm just a sinner, I've made such a mess of things, even though perhaps he hasn't. When a man is at the lowest, then he's at the highest because God can help him. But he can't help proud, proud people. Verse 18, again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. This is Gabriel. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. And so God breaks us to make us. He crushes us to crown us. So here is a man in the presence of Gabriel, in the presence of God, when he's at the bottom, God says to him, peace, be strong. That's what God would say to you. When you're down, when you feel beat up, when you feel nobody cares, when you're discouraged, when your work situation has fallen through the floor, when you can't make another sale, when crooked people are winning, God says, Peace, be strong, it's not over. Verse 20, so he said, do you know why I've come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, this demon. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come, another one. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael your prince. Listen to this. One great scholar said, the stilling of one storm is marked by the rising of another. The battle goes on. The prince of Persia goes. The prince of Greece comes. Another demon. But God says, peace. The battle goes on. Everyone is involved, you and me, even in this church. If your eyes could be open, you'd see holy angels and maybe demons saying, don't listen. The battle goes on. The great controversy between Christ and Satan. The issues are enormous. Who will rule the universe? Who will rule planet Earth? Who will control your destiny? One day soon, I will talk to you on Daniel 10, Daniel 11, and 12. The question is, what's going to happen to God's people? When you get through to those verses you read, at that time, Michael, the great prince, will stand up. And everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise will shine like the stars and like the firmament forever and ever. And then the last words to Daniel are these words. Daniel, you're going to rest but you're going to stand in your lot and receive your reward at the end of the days. Jesus wins the battle. Listen, when will the war be over? When Jesus comes. When will the soldiers come home? Now we're not talking about some earthly little skirmish. When will the soldiers come home? When Jesus comes, 
When will the prisoners of war come home? The prisoners of war are sleeping in the grave when Jesus comes. When will there be peace? When Jesus comes. When will the enemy be destroyed? When Jesus comes. Just know it. The great controversy goes on between Christ and Satan. But in spite of appearances, Christ is still Lord. Amen. Amen.